anxiety, depression, and pain. Not necessarily in that order. So actually, let's start with pain. So uh, conceptually, let's think about something. Before we start, think about what's involved if I say to you, hand me a pen. Well, you have to think about it. You have to figure out, well, what is a pen? Do I have a pen? Where would I find this pen? Then you have to create a motor response. You have to uh, reach for a pen. You have to find it. You have to then physically hand it to me. I have to understand what a pen is. All stimuli have very complex components to their perception. And so there's both objective, things that exist in the real world, and then subjective, sort of my perceptions and my opinions of things. Uh, and all of those things are going to factor into all perceptions, including the perception of pain. So when you have pain, normally it starts with nociceptors. So you have some sort of stimulation of one of your nerve receptors in the periphery usually. It can be stimulated by pressure, by heat, um, by decreased blood flow, but no matter what, one of these nociceptors is stimulated. When it's stimulated, usually bradykinin and prostaglandins are secreted. These are both very important because these are both ways that we might be able to interrupt the pain sequence. Um, also, when you have pain, however, histamine, potassium, hydrogen ions, lots of different things change. Um, so those neurotransmitters then stimulate two major kinds of fibers in your nervous system, the A delta fibers and the C fibers. This is especially important because the A delta fibers are for acute pain. The C fibers are more for chronic pain. It's especially important because when someone has acute pain and the A delta fibers are stimulated, you're going to get a sympathetic response. You're going to get increased pulse rate. You're going to get some sweating. You're going to get a classic response. When someone has chronic pain and the C fibers are stimulated, you won't have any of those responses. And this is why when someone has chronic pain, they're sitting there without looking uncomfortable necessarily, um, but they may in fact be in substantial pain. Uh, some individuals are very cynical. Well, they didn't look like they were in pain uh, because they're thinking of that usual A delta response. Now, A delta fi fibers are myelinated, and this is very important because when something is myelinated, it basically bounces from node to node along the outside of the nerve, um, and the conduction is accelerated substantially. Uh, there's certain conditions in which those nerves will demyelinate acutely, something like Guillain-Barre syndrome, chronically, something like multiple sclerosis. Um, but in an intact patient with normal A delta fibers, they're myelinated, and it, you're going to get a very quick response, and they're going to feel a sharp, well-defined pain. The C fibers are not myelinated, uh, and thus they tend to have more of a sensation of burning or aching. So the pain impulse travels up to the spinal cord, and then it's perceived, it's described, it's localized, and it's interpreted. Um, this is one of many reasons that pain is very much of a subjective impulse. Uh, we really don't know what patient's previous experience with pain is. We don't know how uh, other um, neurotransmitters are being stimulated or not stimulated. Uh, some people, pain actually creates anxiety, it creates depression. Uh, and this is why a lot of the neurotransmitters that are involved in pain are also involved in anxiety and depression. So the limbic system regulates that emotional and cognitive response to pain. Um, and so something that causes substantial pain in one patient will cause little or no pain in another patient because of previous experience. So a referred pain is when nociceptor A is stimulated, but when it gets to the spinal tract, uh, the spinal cord uh, seems to perceive that it's actually nociceptor B or nociceptor A and B. And so when you have ischemia to your heart, 
there's something called six dermatome pain where all of those nerves go into the spinal cord and not only will you feel pain in your heart in your chest you'll fa feel pain shooting down your left arm you'll feel pain shooting up into your jaw so what happens well when the body has response to pain um, it releases something called endorphins these endorphins basically get into the receptors that um, uh, block pain we refer to them as opioid receptors because externally we can put opium into the body and it will also block those receptors um, and so um, opium is produced by poppies so when those uh, um, nerve endings are blocked by a medicine such as a narcotic um, they're either blocked completely or partially. And so there's various types, there's mu receptors, there's three or four different types of narcotic receptors. And a lot of the more common narcotics are gonna get into all of them. It's gonna block uh, uh, all of the narcotic receptors in the brain, but also those in the bowel and cause constipation uh, and cause substantial issues. Um, in the respiratory center it will slow the respirations you'll get a lot of side effects because of all the different places that the opioids um, stimulate now sometimes we want to use a medicine that doesn't stimulate all of the receptors that doesn't cause as much constipation that doesn't cause as much um, respiratory depression and therefore we use medicines like buprenorphine which are what they call partial agonists also referred to as agonist antagonists um, because sometimes they actually get into the receptors and and block them such that the normal endorphins can't even stimulate so that they actually you know are essentially an antagonist um, the key point here though is is that some some narcotics give you um, very broad, broad effect and others give you a much more selective effect so signs of pain well a sign is something that you can see a symptom is something the patient tells you so when you have somatic pain uh, ie muscle pain it's gonna hurt like a son of a gun they're gonna have sharp pain um, visceral pain is gonna be much more uh, low grade dull aching far fewer receptors in the viscera in the organs uh, so abdominal pain is much more diffuse much harder to figure out uh, and sort of uh, we've already talked about the difference between sort of acute and chronic pain now since the 1970s or so um, there's been a great interest in how we should approach the issue of pain Margot McCaffrey was a nurse who was sort of a pioneer in the 1970s and she really felt like we were under treating pain and so um, she said that we should consider pain to be whatever the person experiencing it says it is and we should believe them the problem is is that uh, that has unfortunately led to sometimes patients exaggerating their pain and getting too many medications and so the pendulum has kind of swung and now we often don't believe the patient and unless we have objective evidence of pain we don't believe that they have pain um, this has led to you know decreased narcotic abuse but it's also led to some patients being chronically in pain when maybe they shouldn't be so hopefully the pendulum will kind of swing back to the middle and we'll find that um, that mid-range that happy place um, but as of right now we're at a very challenging time where we're trying to balance taking care of people and reducing their pain um, but not producing um, narcotic addicts and narcotic abuse um, it is interesting because most of the narcotics that we're using have been around for 50 75 years the amount of abuse has really increased over the past 10 to 15 years probably related to um, social factors as much as medical factors um, but we are in a position where we need to do as much as we can to help prevent that so there are other pharmacologic ways I'm not going to talk about non pharmacologic ways but there's lots of those as well obviously right so acupuncture um, physical therapy massage there's lots of different non pharmacological ways 
So pharmacologically, we know that um, when um, the um, nerve fibers are, are stimulated, not only do they, um, are they blocked by opioids, um, but they also stimulate other responses such as cyclooxygenase and prostaglandins. And we know that if we block those, we can decrease inflammation and we can decrease pain. Um, COX-1 are found uh, uh, diffusely throughout the body. Uh, COX-2 are actually uh, found most places except for the uh, stomach. So one of the concerns was that uh, um, a lot of these medicines, the NSAIDs, were causing GI bleeds um, because they blocked the usual mechanism that protected the stomach and, and the acid would then erode through. We now know that if we use the COX-2 inhibitors, that uh, that does not happen to anywhere near the extent. Uh, and so that does give us another option. Um, Celebrex are, uh, is a medicine that is a COX-2 inhibitor. The COX-1 inhibitors, the non-selective ones, such as ibuprofen, such as um, naproxen, uh, those medicines are effective for pain. Uh, they do have a slightly increased incidence of cardiovascular issues and cardiovascular disease. Um, that has not been a major concern of a lot of people. Uh, although it may be more substantial than you think it is when you look into it. There's another medicine that we're not exactly sure how it works, even though it's been around since 1877, and that's acetaminophen called paracetamol in, in uh, Europe and the UK. Um, um, but, you know, we all know it by the brand name Tylenol, and we'll often refer to it as Tylenol. Um, and this is a medicine that we really don't know how it works. We know that there is some central nervous system cyclooxygenase effects and maybe that's the effect um, we think it um, anandamide is a, a cannabinoid type uh, um, neuroreceptor that uh, i'm sorry neurotransmitter uh, that we know that it uh, it does uh, simulate and get into those uh, receptors as well um, i think that the cannabinoid um, system is uh, pretty poorly understood at this point uh, may actually be determined to be the cause of um, the effect of uh, acetaminophen, but it may not too. Uh, and there's other cannabinoids, you know, CBD, THC, those kinds of things that are being um, thrown out there uh, as great controllers of pain. A number of patients do see substantial relief, whether this is placebo effect, whether it's real, whether it's a combination. Uh, is not exactly completely understood. There does seem to actually be some some true benefit as far as pain control, uh, but unfortunately, um, the amount of research that we have is is pretty limited. So let's move on to anxiety. Uh, anxiety is something that we see lots and lots of patients have. Um, unfortunately, we are seeing an increased incidence of anxiety, maybe related to our fast-paced lives and all of the uh, devices that we use, um, but anxiety is a sensation of fear, fast heart rate, choking feeling, nausea, dizziness, tingling, uh, and it can really interfere with life. It can be caused by psychological factors, stress, loss of a loved one, any of those kinds of things, but medical illness can also do it. Uh, hypoxia uh, can be a, a very concerning cause of anxiety. So when you have a patient and they're on, uh, um, you know, oxygen saturation monitoring, if their oxygen saturation starts to go down, they may actually start to feel some anxiety. And of course, there's um, medications, stimulant med medications, and a number of others that will cause anxiety. Is there a difference between fear and anxiety? Absolutely. Um, fear is a known issue. If I am standing outside and I happen to see a dog growling at me, I am afraid. If I am sitting inside and I have no good reason to feel that sensation and it suddenly comes on to me, gradually comes on to me, um, then I'm anxious. Um, not a huge um, difference in, in meaning. Um, but fear is something that you usually will get over pretty quickly uh, as soon as the stimulus is removed. Uh, a lot of patients have fear of flying that is somewhat different than anxiety, uh, although not everybody gets that. So 
how does anxiety occur within the body? Um, we think that there's three basic things that might cause it. There's a noradrenergic model. Um, nor in this uh, um, situation does not mean the opposite of. It just means a variation of. So adrenergic means uh, um, epinephrine, fight or flight. Um, uh, we know that there's the GABA or benzodiazepine model. So GABA is a substance that occurs in the brain when you're stressed. Oh my gosh, your body produces GABA to try to calm you down. Um, there's several different medications that we use that get into these GABA receptors. Um, the most common that patients use is alcohol. The problem is, is that these receptors tend to downregulate pretty quickly and the body stops producing it. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the serotonin. Serotonin is that chemical in your body that basically says, you know what? Everything's okay. Uh, and if it gets too low, you don't feel that way. You feel awful. Um, interestingly, if serotonin gets too high, you actually start to feel anxious and itchy. And, uh, and when I say itchy, I don't mean physically itchy. I mean just wanting to jump out of your skin. Uh, and can develop something called serotonin syndrome. There's a number of different medications that increase the amount of serotonin in your body, SSRIs, a number of the um, migraine medicines are serotonin agonists. There's some of the um, nausea medicines that are serotonin agonists. Some of the pain medicines, including tramadol, has not only a selective opioid stimulation, but also some serotonin agonism. Um, and so if you have all of those medicines together, you get too much serotonin and it will actually cause anxiety. So, so serotonin is um, a neurotransmitter that has to be sort of in a sweet spot. It has to be in the normal range. Too high, not good. Too low, not good. So what causes anxiety? Well, it's probably a combination of all of these things. You know, you have a little too much uh, sympathetic nervous stimulation. You have a little too little serotonin because your body's used it all up. Um, you have a little um, too little GABA because your body has um, um, used it all up or has downregulated it by using too much alcohol or benzos. And then you feel anxious. So the neuroadrenergic model with the sympathetic nervous system, what can we do? Well, we could actually block it using beta blockers, and we sometimes do do that. Uh, we most commonly do that if someone has a big presentation. Oh my gosh, you know, I have to defend my dissertation. I have to present this major thing to a company. Uh, sometimes a beta blocker will decrease that sensation of anxiety by lowering the heart rate, lowering the blood pressure. So the benzo model. So basically GABA, um, and I won't say it because it's a complicated word and you don't really need to know it, um, but GABA is a major inhibitory transmitter in the brain. It slows stuff down. It basically says, you know what, calm down. Uh, and alcohol does the same thing as GABA. Um, and again, the problem, of course, is, is that if you use a lot of alcohol, you'll stop producing your own GABA. So benzos are great medicines to use short term if someone's having a panic attack, if someone's flying to California and they are scared to death of doing it, it will relax them. The problem, as we noted, is that the body stops making the GABA after a week or two of use. Uh, and thus, to get them off these medicines, you have to withdraw them very slowly. And unfortunately, some people's ability to produce GABA never really recovers and you can get them off, but their life is ter terrible, or you never get them off. So serotonin, again, the, oh, the world is okay chemical. Um, could be too much or too little. Uh, if too little, the SSRIs will help. Uh, and if it's too much, you, you know, they might be on an SSRI, you need to back off it, or look at some of their other medicines and see what might be also producing or uh, increasing the levels of serotonin. So we talked about using beta blockers. You can stimulate those GABA receptors using benzodiazepines. Um, unfortunately, uh, long term, that's not a great strategy. So we're left mostly with balancing serotonin. 
So ways to increase serotonin, you can give the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So basically what this does is this um, slows down the metabolism of serotonin and thus increases the amount of circulating serotonin in your system. Um, there's another medicine called uh, selective norepinephrine uh, and serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are the SNRIs. Uh, these both increase serotonin and increase norepinephrine. Um, so uh, basically, some people do benefit by these. Some people get overstimulated by them. Uh, they tend to be good in people that are uh, low energy because of their depression. Um, but uh, again, they can worsen anxiety in some people. Uh, anxiety can be paradoxical because... Um, um, similar to ADD. So when you have ADD, you're basically uh, irritated because you're not alert enough. You're basically not able to pay attention, which irritates you and makes you grumpy. So stimulating someone makes them more relaxed and able to attend. On the other hand, if you have someone that doesn't have ADD and you give them these medicines, it stimulates them and makes them more nervous and anxious and less able to attend. Now, there's another medicine that does increase serotonin effect. It's actually a direct agonist onto the 5-HT1A, the 1A receptor, uh, and that's called buspirone. Uh, and some, uh, some of the newer um, anti-anxiety, antidepressant medicines also try to stimulate that to decrease anxiety. Moving on to depression. So depression is a syndrome in which people are not able to function at a high enough level because of a lack of a neurotransmitter. Now the problem is that a lot of people equate depression to sadness. Depression is not the same thing as sadness. Sadness is often referred to as depression uh, when someone is not being treated clinically. Oh, they're depressed. Well, in fact, they may be sad. Depression is when you're not sleeping, when you're not getting along with people, when you're not able to function. Depression is a subtle but important um, different syndrome than sadness. Now, many people who are depressed also do feel sad. Uh, and by putting them on a medicine, we can help get rid of some of that sadness. But especially the elderly can have depression without sadness, in which it's really interfering with their life. We put them on medicines and they function much better. And so we try to change those neurotransmitter levels um, similar to what we did with um, anxiety. Uh, the same neurotransmitters tend to be involved with anxiety, depression, and to a lesser extent, pain. Um, if you have someone that has depression related to their situation, uh, their spouse died, their dog died, their car died, um, they're going to be less likely to respond to these increases in neurotransmitters just because they have real meaningful reasons to feel sad and depressed. Um, and, you know, have insomnia and all those kinds of things. Um, on the other hand, lots of times those things will actually lead to changes in neurotransmitter levels that will persist beyond when whatever the situational issue is that occurred. So situational depression in and of itself will often not respond very well to medications, although if it persists for any period of time, the neurotransmitter changes that occur along with it, often will respond to treatment. Some people just seem to be born with inadequate neurotransmitters. Um, I see a lot of people who are um, depressed, and I say to them, is there anybody else in your family that's depressed? Oh yeah, my mother's depressed, my grandmother's depressed, my aunt's depressed. I think that uh, there's not a whole lot of strong evidence, but I think it's a reasonable theory to believe that some of these people either just don't produce enough serotonin uh, or it's easily uh, for their uh, system to be overwhelmed. So again, going back to the signs and system uh, symptoms of depression, yes, mood changes do occur. They do feel sadness, um, but you can also have people that just have low energy, poor appetite, sleep problems, decreased libido, and other similar symptoms.
So again, we know that uh, norepinephrine, if it's too low, uh, might cause depression, and that's why we try to raise it with SNRIs. We know that people that have low serotonin can be depressed. We raise it with SSRIs or SNRIs. And we also know that some people, um, dopamine is kind of that happiness neurotransmitter that you have, um, as well as doing balance and all sorts of other things that uh, uh, come out when you see somebody with Parkinson's disease because they don't have adequate dopamine. Um, but those people will often feel um, depressed as well. So if you have low norepinephrine, in the old days, we used to use tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, we know that they have lots of um, side effects, however. Uh, most of these side effects are anticholinergic, the can't see, can't spit, can't pee, can't defecate type. Um, but they also will have impact on the heart, and they can cause substantial heart dysrhythmias. So the dosing that you need to treat depression is pretty high. Um, the dose that you need to treat pain and some of the other things that uh, low norepinephrine uh, levels um, can cause tend to actually be lower. So we'll use these medicines to help with insomnia. We'll use these medicines to help with chronic pain, especially neurologic pain. It's anticholinergic side effects uh, exactly as we noted. So the can't see, can't spit stuff, but they all also cause balance changes. Um, and the heart may become very irregular with overdose. The margin of safety, the difference between the therapeutic dose and the toxic dose are pretty concerning if you're talking about the therapeutic dose for depression. SSRIs, as we noted, are um, drugs that will increase the amount of serotonin in your system. Um, they're not completely impossible, but, but are essentially practically impossible to overdose on. People can get a serotonin syndrome, um, but there's only been uh, one or two people that have been felt to have overdosed from serotonin uh, uptake inhibitors, um, and those people probably took five or 600 tablets. One of them was a pharmacy tech that had access to a large number. Um, you can get a little bit of nausea uh, in the first week or two. I always warn people that they should fight through it. Um, sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction does happen, but it's not as common as delayed ejaculation uh, or um, impaired ability to reach orgasm in the woman. So um, it is something that uh, I do warn uh, people about because if they do have these sexual changes um, and they're not expecting them, it can be pretty um, concerning to them. SNRIs, there's a number of them. Duloxetine and uh, venlafaxine are actually pretty similar but pretty different. Uh, duloxetine seems to have more benefit as far as chronic pain. Uh, venlafaxine tends to cause a lot more tolerance and it's very hard to come off of. Um, this is why a lot of people don't like to use it. It can be very effective for depression, however, the desvenlafaxine, uh, which is one of the phenomenons, one of the things that we see is that when a drug comes off patent, a lot of the drug companies will go back. They'll try to isolate, well, what was the most effective component of this? Uh, and then they'll uh, then market that as a separate drug. That drug is now on patent and they can make more money on it. Uh, Lexapro is actually the same medicine as Celexa except that it's the more purified, more effective uh, portion of it. And so they did get uh, several more years of um, profit off of it. Although a lot of people do feel like Lexapro is a more effective medicine than Celexa. Those are both um, SSRIs, of course. Um, atypical depress antidepressants, we think those probably increase dopamine levels, something like Wellbutrin is an example of that. Uh, bupropion is the generic name. Uh, it is uh, a little bit concerning. One of the side effects is seizures. I've only seen one patient in the past 30 years that got seizures, and this is someone that tried to overdose on it. Uh, and he took 10 tablets of the 300 milligram, uh, and he did have seizures. I haven't particularly seen seizures otherwise, but if someone already has a tendency towards seizures, you know, history of seizures, whatever, we're probably going to avoid this medication. So here's some drugs of the week. Uh, we'll post them and you can uh, discuss them on Blackboard. 
uh, and um, any questions uh, I'll try to respond to and I encourage you all to uh, try to answer each other's questions uh, and work as a team to get this all figured out.